So hi everyone, I'm so excited that you came and joined this session. I'm Robin Farman Farmian. I'm a professional speaker, author, and entrepreneur working on cutting edge technology, things like virtual reality for stroke and brain injury rehabilitation, as well as things like cryopreserving organs for organ transplants. Now today, I will be moderating the session and I'm going to have the panelists now give a little bit of an introduction on who they are and a little bit about their startup companies. So Kelly, I'm gonna start with you. Hi there, my name is Kelly Thomas Drake. I'm the CEO and founder of a healthcare mobile app company called My Purple Folder, the patient care easy button. It's called My Purple Folder because when I was going through being the caregiver for my grandmother, it was all consuming, very overwhelming, and we kept all of her information in a purple folder. So an homage to her and all of those struggles for someone not to ever have to go through it again, we call it My Purple Folder. We create a universal digital healthcare master key that seamlessly helps caregivers and their patients navigate their own healthcare through connecting to all the disparate electronic medical record systems they have profiles in, and we simplify the information. If you ever want somebody not to know something, you put it in writing. And so we make sure that it's visible, easy, gamified, digestible, and all for you. So you don't have to do the heavy lifting. That's incredible. And I'm assuming a lot of this is using artificial intelligence and it's not human beings that are doing everything. That's right. Yes? That's absolutely right. That is awesome. Okay, so Alan, Alan Gale, would you please introduce yourself and a little bit about what you do? Sure, hi. Uh, thank you for attending today. My name is Alan Gale. I'm the CEO and founder of Amy Health, and we're a personalized nutrition platform that brings uh, practitioners and patients together with a set of digital um, health tools. So they include online assessments, uh, science-based protocols, and a mobile app that helps identify all of a person's nutritional needs from a series of photographs. That's awesome. And you've, you're on the market now, right? We are, we are, yep. And we've, so cool. um, we've been really focused on COVID-19 and improving people's immunity and helping facilitate practitioners to be more effective with their patients and to really grow their practice in a, in a new world with uh, different tools. That's amazing. So Jared, wonderful that you could join us. Could you give us a little bit of a, a rundown on who you are? Sure, Jared Eula, CEO of Health Talk AI. Um, Health Talk AI is really was founded to help providers and patients connect in a meaningful way. So what Health Talk AI does is essentially we engage all patients, um, either post-discharge or otherwise, identify gaps in care in real time using AI, a bot technology, and then we close the loop and we close the loop uh, either with an e-visit or a telehealth visit. Have you seen a lot changing during the coronavirus with your particular company? Huge growth, huge yeah. growth. I think, uh, yeah, we, we've, um, we've signed probably seven or eight deals last month, tracking the same this month. It's been huge. I think um, just that need from folks, you know, we're looking at virtual care as an option. And when COVID hit, there was not an option, right? So basically coming into that thing, we were a virtual care platform, uh, really saw a lot of growth where patients could not be seen uh, face to face. We gave them an option to be able to touch all their patients, give them information, but also assess patients that are having COVID symptoms and not just see if they're having symptoms, get them to the care, not only give them the care, get them the testing and then the follow-up. So we actually help them track them through the whole process. So we, we've seen a big, big growth uh, with COVID and um, unfortunately or fortunately, we were, we were told to, to be able to help. That's, that's amazing though. I'm really glad that you were able to, to make a difference. And last but not least, the famous man on the Zoom right now, Balint. He wanted to give just a, a little bit about who you are for the very few people who might not know. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Balin Bella. I'm the CEO of Bena Studio, and uh, Bena Studio is a digital product consultancy, and we have a special focus on telehealth. We develop quality mobile and web applications, and we integrate uh, complex systems for enterprises and for startups as well. And uh, I have a diverse background uh, in technology design and uh, business. 
and I'm interested in telehealth, AI, and IoT. Uh, so this is why, why we be organizing uh, this conference series, and I believe that knowledge sharing is really, really important nowadays. So uh, I hope that uh, we can uh, share a lot of experiences with each other uh, in this session. Thank you. I mean, and thank you for bringing us all together. It's wonderful when we can collaborate across Europe and the United States. It's one of my favorite things to do. I've done a lot of work over in Europe. So let's dive into it. You see that all of our panelists today are incredible experts in the world of telemedicine and their world has blown up in the past four months. So let's get into some questions. And by the way, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the QA. I will be reading it throughout the panel. So go ahead and put them up there, I'll see them. So first question, I'm gonna to talk to uh, Alan. What are the biggest practitioner needs that don't get addressed right now by standard telehealth platforms? I think probably the biggest one is the patient outreach. And, you know, a lot of practitioners have a large customer base who suddenly are no longer coming to see them in their brick and mortar office. They're not sure whether it's safe to, you know, even leave their house. Um, and so the ability for the practitioners to still have that ongoing conversation and communication with them is very important. Um, so one thing that we found was that our online assessment is actually a very engaging way for those practitioners to reach out to the patients to get important information about their health status, their needs, and then almost perform a digital triage and get back to them with more specific answers to address what those needs are. That's interesting. Kelly, what do you think? What's going on in your world with this? So what actually happens is that the practitioners in order to reach their patients um the business of healthcare, and of course it's the business of healthcare. it's about um telehealth has existed but there hasn't been a way to be reimbursed for it and so what what actually has happened as a result of covid um with this exponential growth is that health practitioners now have a code modifier that helps them get reimbursed for seeing patients with you know, telemedicine. So what's ending up happening is that they're actually able to pay for our technologies to help them seamlessly see patients over telehealth, using AI, using all of these leveraging uh, technology uh, databases because they're now being brought to the 21st century with also having a way to support it financially. There hasn't been necessarily a way to to financially support all of this through insurance. And so now that they have these modifiers um, and these relaxed privacy laws with having HIPAA compliance, that's in the uh, American HIPAA compliance um, and saying, you know, completely uh, compliant with every, every single privacy law, uh, it, it now is, is reaching a critical mass where we now have access through telemedicine and, and having a way to pay for it. So there's more doctors being able to reach their patient population without, um, without it being a matter of friction. It's, it's rather frictionless, it's rather easy, and they're just expanding. So it's, it's a great time to be a telehealth and uh, digital healthcare company. Now, I, I noticed earlier today during uh, Fabian's session, they were talking about some of the telemedicine re, uh, reimbursement codes. Does anyone on the panel know how many are out now at this point? So I, I was actually Googling it and I was trying, when they asked that question earlier today, and I was trying to find any company that had put it together in a really easy to read format. I thought BrainCheck had but I, I wasn't able to find it. So that's a really big opportunity right now for any of the startups that are working in this space to create that one pager that, every, that you can send out because it would have been sent around this entire conference with your logo on it. Just a little hint. Balan, I would love for you to give us your opinion on that last question, the, the biggest practitioner needs that don't get addressed right now by standard telemedicine platforms. Yes, for uh, doctors uh, and for smaller doctor offices, uh, there is a need uh, to build up their own uh, brand, own uh, local uh, personal uh, service. So they would like to control the price, the costs, the 
the services. Uh, it's, an, it's an underserved uh, segment within telemedicine since uh, the, the major platforms are more, more uh, managing uh, the whole uh, process. And, uh, and the control of the uh, patient relationship uh, and the care continuity is, is also an important aspect uh, for many doctors. Uh, they, in many times, they uh, wouldn't like uh, just to jump in, jump out from uh, random visits, but uh, they would like to take care of uh, long-lasting uh, relationships with the with the uh, patients. And uh, still, uh, there are a few uh, segments of uh, health, like equipment-heavy uh, visits, uh, which are more tricky to provide uh, remotely. So it's. It's also an underserved uh, segment, and uh, for this kind of uh, services, a lot of uh, physical uh, tools and IoT uh, solutions are needed. So it's a bit more more complex, and uh, there are um, visits where uh, physical interaction is really really important. So uh, to to simulate it remotely, it's also a bit more tricky. So these segments could be could be new new territories, and uh, the patient record access uh, is also a pain point for uh, many doctors uh, because if patients are uh, visiting different uh, providers, then it's really hard to to get an overview uh, from a doctor's perspective. So it's definitely a need to, to be able to see all the records from the past. And uh, still uh, serving patients with uh, lower digital literacy or, or uh, who can't afford direct pay or uh, ma mainstream uh, compatible insurances, uh, it's, a, it's a, a consumer segment uh, which, is, which is underserved uh, by uh, telemedicine services since uh, the the uh, mainstream is is uh, is that that users who are easy customers and who can uh, use the the digital services easily and uh, and can pay for the services easily but there are many other people who who still need care and uh, and we should uh, focus on them as well Great, thank you. And uh, I'm going to have Jared answer this question, but then Kelly, I want to actually come to you about the data interoperability that Balant just brought up on how there's that disparity where you've got EMRs in different hospitals and really getting it all together because I think you're going to have some really good insights on that. But first, Jared, I would love to hear the, your answer to that first question, like the biggest practitioner needs right now. Yeah, I mean, I feel... Um... I mean, obviously, Health Talk is really focused on this, right? And and I think I didn't pay Alan to say the outreach component, but that I could have, maybe I did. No, but that's that's a big component of Health Talk, right? Is that it's got to be um, uh, incorporated into their quality efforts, right? So when you have a telehealth visit, in the need when somebody's sick. Well, that's that's um, that's not doesn't really align with value-based care, right? So, a lot of our customers want to essentially assess their patients, find out the ones that may be having issues or think maybe they haven't been seen in a year, right? So, be able to do that and be able to parse that out to, to the the outreach ends in a uh, in a telehealth visit is really what they're looking for. I think the other thing is is that um, is is multi language is is big. Right, being able to actually have an outreach, communicate with patients, be able to put their value proposition out there, and meet the patients where they are and what language they speak is key too. And I think um, th those two things are really important in terms of being able to offer telehealth and what the patient's going to be getting be getting out of the the service. And are you talking uh, the languages just that the practitioners are actually speaking? or really just designing the app so that it is multi-language. Yeah, so, so with HealthTalk, we're not an app. We use bot technology, so we're communicating in multi-languages, right? So we're technically appless, but it's twofold. So we, we have the capability where we can add multiple people to the room, um, and that oftentimes is our interpreters, 
for the providers. And so I think um, those things are, are, are actually helping with, uh, with those the struggles. I think the other thing is, is obviously is we need to reduce the other barriers to the telehealth, right? In terms of logins and passwords and those type of things. So all those things are, are, are barriers that we aim to kind of help solve. And you know, you're solving even more of a barrier because in, in person, if you were to go to a hospital and you're, you speak a language that's not necessarily the first language in that particular country, sometimes it can be very difficult to find an interpreter. Right, and, and that can be very scary for the patient. And so when, you re, when all of this is just done by video or, or telemedicine, you can be there for the patient. And that, that is, that's really big. So thank you for doing that. Kelly, I'd love to hear your opinion on the data on interoperability, because it really is a big problem being able to get my, my Stanford records with my UCSF records with my one medical records. So what we do is we create the Universal Digital Healthcare Master Key for you to seamlessly get in and out of all of your records uh, and have a centralized view of it without having to store all of the information. So all we do is we create the Universal Digital Healthcare Master Key. You think about um, search engines when uh, the internet was first created and then if you couldn't find it in one, it's the other. Search engines being electronic medical record systems and then Google comes along and doesn't change their model uh, and make sure that they synthesize the information in order to uh, provide a central view of it. That's what we're doing. We're Googleizing your healthcare, we're your Zelle for your healthcare marketplace. We make it seamless. Uh, you're able to look at everything, just like with mint.com is not another bank. It's a central way of looking at it. And then also we simplify it so that you don't have to be a Nobel laureate uh, within medicine or a technological genius in order to intuit what's going on. And so what Balint was talking about, um, that is a real problem. And with regard to interoperability, part of that, in addition to remaining uh, meaningful use and, and hit trust and HIPAA compliant and all of those things, is such that you're not trying to be another electronic medical record system. There's no need to be a redundancy or recreate the wheel. So what we do is make sure that you see it as soon as you request it, but then as soon as you stop looking at it, it snaps back to where it originally is housed. It's already housed somewhere. So, and we translate it so that you can interact with it. People are more compliant. There are better outcomes for the administrators and the physicians when there's a patient population that is informed um, and does not have to look elsewhere to receive that information. And so we make sure that we put the power in the power, you know, the hands of the patients. And then for the practitioners who we sell to, we sell the enterprises, so they make it available to their patient population. They have improved outcomes. They can see more patients. It's more efficient. Everybody's happy. It's a win-win. And so um, in terms of interoperability, we're not trying to tell electronic medical record systems to, to forget their proprietary uh, issues where they want to keep it closed. We're just making sure that it's hubbed by the patient and their caregiver so that they're more compliant patients. And so it's, it's, it, it increases enterprise savings for the enterprise that deals with having a more efficient way of creating better outcomes for their patient population. And so that's, that's where we are with that. We don't have to store the information. That's part of what the interoperability issues have been. And when you leverage and connect and make sure that people have a non-friction, a frictionless you know, user experience where they can intuit how to deal with it, that's where you have the sticking point in the conversion into ongoing customers. And that, that's so true because in healthcare, we don't typically give people the Amazon or the Google or the Apple experience, but now that consumers are really taking control of their own healthcare, we've got to start delivering them, that to them. We're, you know, patients were rising up and we're saying we're not going to deal with, you know, fax type things anymore, that mindset, right? All right, so let's go on to question two. What's different now about the patient acquisition using telemedicine and how do you even reach some of those first patients who have never used telemedicine before? Alan, let's start with you. Well, um, some of the other panel members have talked about this as well, including Jared, and it's what I mentioned earlier with respect to that initial outreach. So, you know, as, as you pointed out as well, you want to meet the patients where they are and what they're doing. Um, so digital means to do that is a very important component of it. 
Um, but there's also needs that are unique, I think, right now to COVID um, and the era that we're living in with respect to social isolation. And so introducing group practices that might incorporate coaching, for example, in, in an environment where you're seeing 10 to 20 people at once, but you're also building a community among the people who are attending. And that stickiness that comes with that and that camaraderie and the accountability that comes from that is a really important element. So combining that with educational elements, you know, that Kelly talked about, which I agree are really, really important, um, creates this sort of mini community that links the practitioner and the patient networks in a very efficient manner and provides a lot of value. So you're still reaching then the, uh, the initial patients through their practitioners? Yes and no. So okay. we, we certainly want to encourage that, but you know, by using programs, for example, like a group coaching program that might have a particular set of curriculum around, for example, immunity, um, and by being able to allow many practitioners to implement that same program in different parts of the country within their practice or otherwise, now because of that consistency, you've also opened up the opportunity for national uh, types of accounts and larger populations that can use that same program with different practitioners in small little communities all over the place. Um, so it starts to build up you know, value from that. And then it, it even adds to the science itself because in our case, we're collecting both nutritional information and we're comparing that against more traditional biomarker information like blood tests and vital signs and even symptoms. And so with those populations, we can start to learn and differentiate why does one person respond to this type of food or nutrient differently than somebody else. And so by taking that information that we acquire, we can then pour it back into the algorithm and adapt our protocols to be more specific for individuals and thereby improving everybody's health as a result of participation. I was thinking that you must have an incredibly exciting and interesting database. <laughs> That's well, it's, it is, and it's, build, and it's building every day. And, you know, to me, the, the biggest missing piece in healthcare um, is really just uh, what's been present outside of healthcare, and it needs to be reincorporated back in. And that's really a person's nutrition. You know, we know what a huge effect that is on a person's actual health, but the, there's a, been a disconnect between the nutritional people who are looking at what you're putting into your body and the medical community that's looking at biomarkers coming out of your body to understand what's happening. So linking those two together has, has a profound value for both sides of, of that equation. And it's incredibly true because uh, what I didn't mention earlier is that I'm also a chronic disease patient. I've had 43 hospitalizations, six major surgeries, and three organs removed. For Crohn's disease, it ended up being. And half of my treatment is definitely things like Remicaid and you know, going and seeing my doctors. But really half of the reason that I am so functional and so able to, to live a full life with the severe chronic disease is because of that nutrition and diet you know, aspect. Crohn's is a GI disease and, and it really is a, a big deal on what you put into your body and how I feel the next day, right? So there's a lot of foods I know that I'm just gonna be wiped out for a week if I put into my body. And the fact that this has not been integrated into healthcare up until now has been very confusing, especially in the GI world, let me tell you. So, well, I think Jared, that's changing a lot. So congratulations on, on your success so far and, and best of luck going forward. But you know, it sounds like you're looking at the right things, um, you know, what you're putting in and how that affects you know, how those uh, biomarkers ultimately result and how you feel. Exactly. And it's across the board with autoimmune diseases. It's not just the GI diseases. If you've got an autoimmune, what you're putting into your body is definitely changing the equation as much as medication is. Absolutely agree. Jared, I would love to hear how you are acquiring or, or how you've been seeing out there acquisition of new patients or, or really how to get those patients onto the telemedicine platform. Yeah. So I, I think, um, I mean, it's, it, there's a couple different things that are happening in the market right now around acquiring patients. And I think, you know, the, the first thing is, like we talked about before, is focusing on the barriers. Because there's a lot of clinical need right now 
uh, if there's not a, if there hasn't been a bigger clinical need right now, there, there never has been. I mean, it's quadrupled. So I think it's about not necessarily acquiring them onto the platform. It's really, I think what you're really asking is, is, is how do you move your acquisition strategy from the typical kind of marketing to, to a telehealth kind of platform? That problem, I think, is, is still um, to be determined. And the reason is, is because you're having this friction between groups um, that are affiliated and, and actually the hospital group. And who does the telehealth? Is it, is it the ED group that does the telehealth visit right after the visit? Or is it the primary care that does it? And so that kind of uh, pull and kind of tug in terms of who does it really needs to get figured out because the patient is kind of left in, 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 the, in, the, in the weeds here, kind of trying to figure out what's happening. And what's, what's happening when they do have that friction is they're just going to go to some of the big box players, the Teladocs, the MD Lives, and the other folks, which is better than nothing, but it actually doesn't allow them to, to be sticky within their whole, own health system. Uh, so from a health talk perspective, obviously, if you can incorporate it into not just the patient experience use case, but a clinical use case, and it ends up in terms of a telehealth visit, in either of those scenarios, the group and or the hospital partner is gonna win. But really it's, it's um, the hospitals and the hospital partners need to figure that out. The telehealth vendors like Health Talk, uh, we're just the tool. Um, some of those things have to be figured out by the providers. You know, and I've noticed uh, like companies like United Healthcare, remember this is a Fortune 5, it's the largest payer in the US. They've got about 50 million lives under, under their insurance policies. And they have been emailing me at least once or twice a month for the past two years minimum. Hey, how are you feeling, Robin? Do you need to see a doctor? Click here for one of our Doctors On Demand partners. And it's, it is Doctors On Demand and Amwell, right? And, and, they're, and they say in their emails, you know, we are gonna cover it. It's gonna be a $5 copay. I think currently now it's a $0 copay, but they've been really pushing telemedicine for a few years and it is just to the big players. And so I'm, I'm wondering, I'd like to see some of these smaller players really start to get a lot more traction. So A, there's competition in the market. That always benefits the patient, right? Um, but that they can bring new features and new thinking as well. So Kelly, I would love to know your, your uh, thoughts on this, especially because you are dealing with, with so many different uh, clinics and hospitals. And at least in the world of specialty care, the primary care docs are the ones who typically refer. Oh, you've got an itchy rash. I'm going to send you a referral to dermatology. I'm going to send you a referral to neurology, whatever it is for your particular problem. And all of that now needing to be done by telemedicine. So Kelly, what do you, what do you think about that kind of thing? So I think that, and, and just to piggyback off of what people have been talking about in terms of getting it in the hands of the patient, the actual uh, benefit. Um, you know, there are chronic disease, illness uh, support groups, like within cancer, there's the community support group, which was uh, formerly um, founded by Gilda Ratner, and now it's called, you know, community, uh, cancer support community. And so you can speak with those patients, those practitioners, engage with them, do cross collaboration with regard to marketing. Um, there's also ways to get your name out. Um, with the patient navigator and discharge staff uh, in terms of like administration. And then um, also the ones that are there, there are care coordinators uh, within a, a health enterprise of a certain size that their whole entire job is patient transfers and coordination of care. They also are the casework managers. They do a lot, they wear a lot of hats and you're, you're alleviating them of some of that stress. Part of, of getting um, this in the hands of the patients that need it the most are erasing the pain point from the people who are actually dealing with them. Um, uh, and you manage an asset, you deal with problems. You want to make them feel as though they're managing an asset, which is, which is a simplified way of care coordination. So getting the word out through a telehealth means you actually have to to get out there and and pound the pavement you have to go to the different healthcare centers you have to go to um, the different oncologists uh, you have to go to the different gi specialists in your case you have to go to the different care managers you have to speak with them um, 
and then also approach the the larger ones like you said there's united healthcare and their payer um as well as uh different various healthcare coordination you know and speak to the mckesson speak to the epics speak to the you know the athenas the clinical works and see if if there's synergy and then actually help them know that you're not trying to replace anything that they do which they do amazingly all you're doing is enhancing what they do by making it simplified because what they do is so complex and healthcare is so intimidating and complex simplifying care coordination is where we want to be so it can actually just go out to people's phone naturally as 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 long as they make it available to their patient population that's a really good point Fallon, I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Yes, yeah, so if you talk about um, the doctor's uh, patient acquisition, then uh, then I can see three trends. Uh, the first one is 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 kind of a traditional one uh, where the uh, the basic approach is the doctor patient relationship, and uh, and when the doctor is starting uh, to use a new platform. Uh, they can bring in the existing uh, um, patient base and that uh, platform in that case is just a technical tool set uh, helping the, the uh, tele uh, has um, visits. Uh, this is the, the first trend. Uh, there is the, the opposite when the, when the, uh, when the tele has uh, provider is in the center of the of the activities and uh, and uh, and where doctors don't have to care about the uh, patient acquisition or uh, retention um, because it's all handled by the by the uh, platform so in that case doctors are working in rotation or they don't have personal contact like uh, they are uh, providing asynchronous uh, services so this is the the other main trend and uh, and many big uh, players are within this category and uh, <clears throat> and there is a, a mix uh, between the two where uh, where the platform uh, helps the practitioners to get new patients but also motivate them to convert and and keep uh, them as returning uh, customers um, so it's a uh, it's a middle category between the, the, the two main types. Uh, and uh, I think from a, a patient perspective, a stronger patient-doctor relationship uh, is beneficial. Uh, but, uh, but from other perspectives, like the, like the investment and the, and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and the efficiency aspect, uh, maybe we can understand that uh, that uh, that why uh, many players are focusing on the on the centralized uh, solutions and less on the personal relationships. But uh, I believe that uh, that um, this is a value and uh, and there is a space for this kind of services. Definitely, definitely. Now I'm going to turn to the audience because I'm getting some audience questions. By the way, guys, so I'm getting it through Savannah. So go ahead and put in the chat your name so that I can call you out because um, these are really good questions. So I'm impressed. Uh, so this is to the group. I think Alan might be a really good person to start with this question. Have you seen healthcare professionals pivot into doing coaching programs during these times in addition to their group practice? Yeah, absolutely. And I would suggest this is a trend that started long before COVID. Um, so it's still relatively new for many medical doctors, but other practitioners have adopted this model very successfully. The trend is, is actually kind of exploding among medical doctors now, however, especially with chronic diseases that have a very close association with you know, dietary factors. So there's, there's a couple of really important elements of why it's, it's beneficial for them. Um, the first is the ability to provide ongoing education and accountability um, in a group setting, especially implementing with a coach that's obviously less expensive than a medical doctor, um, provides 
a, a, a very efficient way to get information out and to inform patients. And oftentimes patients don't know what to ask of a doctor and they'll learn something just by listening to somebody else's question in that group environment that helps inform them. Um, and then the other thing that's very beneficial through that is the actual behavior change that comes with it. So, you know, we all know that we need to eat better, we need to exercise more. Doctors have oftentimes very specific instructions about, you know, how to address a particular condition that you might be afflicted with. But people actually doing what they need to do following that visit oftentimes is the biggest impediment to them getting better. So that group practice addresses that behavioral element in addition to the scalability and the information and, and that community that comes with that. You're so right. And uh, one point I loved of yours just now was you don't know what you don't know. So when you're doing something new or you, you suddenly have a brand new disease, going to a support group, people are going to ask those questions that you didn't even know you were supposed to be asking because it didn't even occur to you, right? We're not born knowing about medicine and healthcare. And if you don't work in the industry, it can be very overwhelming and, and there's just so much information. So I, I really love that. I'm gonna to go to another question in the chat from Leah. So clinicians never have, had, never have time to talk to startups. What's the best way to approach them to showcase your solution or talk about your value proposition? Kelly, I would love to throw this one to you because I'm guessing you are talking to a lot as a startup. I am. Um, I, I have a little bit of a leg up slightly. Uh, the majority of all my family are mostly physicians, so it's not, it's not that difficult for me um, because I've been around them and I, I understand their, their kind of idiosyncrasies a little bit. Um, what, what I would suggest uh, with approaching a physician um, is certainly have as much deference when you approach them as possible. Use the, use the you know, genuflex a little bit uh, with the whole, you know, if you don't mind, would you please, uh, I, I, would I would love for your opinion. Um, of course, when you ask for a partnership or money, you get advice. But when you ask for advice, you usually get a partnership or money. So, what you should do is approach knowing, and I'll give you an analogy, right? So who hasn't seen a movie where you're the new kid at school and you go into the cafeteria and you got your lunch tray in your hand and you're just like, I hope somebody asked me to sit at their table. And, and mo most especially, I wanna sit at the popular kids table. That's you with your solution, wanting to speak to a physician, right? And so, or many physicians. What you should do instead is go into the cafeteria and you make the, the cool kids want to sit with you and you sit at whatever table you want. And so what you do is you do the research on who you're about to speak with, weigh where they're actually working, have some statistics, and then call with all the deference in the world, if you will, and ask for an appointment. Um, it's interesting, a closed mouth does not get fed and you'd be, you'd be very uh, intrigued with just asking somebody to do something, they'll do it. But if you are intimidated from talking to them, they'll feel that, you know, just like uh, bees smell fear. Doctors only respond when you're deferential, but then you also come in knowing that you're a cool kid also. So your solution, if it will actually help somebody, let them know that you want to team up. This is the thing that was also told to me, and I will, I will give her credit. My mother's a physician, and she said this to me. I, I started actually crying, um, interestingly enough, when I was on this national panel uh, in DC. I, I, I cried before the panel because I was like, oh my goodness, there are all these physicians, and I'm not, you know, what am I going to do? She said, you know, sweetie, you're not trying to out doctor them you're bringing a solution to them that they have not thought of. Let them be the doctors and you show them your solution and team up together so that you can make a difference and a positive impact in the lives of patients together. And that's how you should come from it. And, and that will empower you every single time you feel intimidated from speaking with them. And I don't care who it is and how high level, or if you've seen them on CNBC, just go up and ask them. 
for just a little bit of their time for some advice and, and you'll get a wonderful response. Believe me. It's true. I mean, basically what you were talking about are some basic business development and sales principles that are applicable across industries. You build the relationship. You, you, first, you identify who you need to meet um, within an, a corporation. You find where they are. Um, sometimes it might just be online during this time, but sometimes they're at conferences. You find them uh, on things like LinkedIn, and then you figure out what's in it for them. Why would partnering with you give them such high ROI, return on investment? Always provide that solution and make your sales pitch clear, fast, and easy to understand. Because busy people don't like to read you know, emails this long. If you are talking to a busy person, which is every doctor in the United States, bullet point it and get your point across in as few words as possible. By the way, that question was from uh, Ijaz. The first question was from Liaz, um, just getting all of that by text right now. Now, I would love to ask another question about how, how do you help practitioners provide greater value for their patients? And Jared, we're gonna start with you with this one. How do we provide? Um, well, I mean, I think that's one of the things that, um, it, it, for Health Talk, you know, I think it's one of those things that we, we give I hate to be this, you know, health off focus, but it's hard not to be. Uh, we, we give them insight into their providers in terms of how they're doing, right? So I think, um, you know, we give them value so that they can give value. And, and the way they do that is they essentially get insight into each provider's performance. I think it's really important. And they can really dig into uh, what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. And I think in that practice, as it, they kind of, ingrain it into that, that patient perspective um, makes them better uh, in terms of what they are. And I think, you know, changing um, the way they provide care uh, is actually adding value uh, to their patients, right? So we're talking about telehealth today. So adding that to their tool bag is, is really another access point. Um, which should be value to their patients. So I think it's, it's twofold when it comes to health talk. I think it's one is give them perspective in terms of um, what their patients think of them. And then the second thing is, is that giving them more access is going to add more value. That's great. I do have another question from the audience I want to get to. And I think Alan would be a good one to answer this because it's about coaching as well. So how do you engage patients that need to use the technology as a change behavior tool, but can't participate in the group practices due to the privacy problems? For instance, the, the patient may not want other people to know they're a chronic disease patient. Sure, so um, we like to think of it in terms of kind of three different levels of engagement that a person could in theory participate. The first is self-guided. So we have programs, for example, that people can learn about issues like immunity and nutrition through a series of programs that we have, you know, lectures, videos, quizzes that summarize the information that gives them that background. Part of that work is also incorporating instructional videos on how to use our mobile app, for example. So you'd think that taking a picture of your food is a you know, very straightforward process, but getting people to actually do it and take a look at the results and start to build a new habit as a result of that is very important. So the second layer is to then go to that group coaching model that I've talked about. The third layer is really one-on-one. -on -one. So we like to start with our digital assessment that moves people into the protocol and the mobile app. Um, and the extent that they're not able to either participate in a group for various reasons, like the ones you mentioned, or they just don't feel comfortable enough learning on their own or using our mobile app on their own, they always have an option to work one-on-one -on -one with a coach or a dietitian or a practitioner, you know, that's more specifically addressing what their problem is. That's, that's, I love that because while it's not the group situation, you still have someone to be able to hold you accountable and who's there that you can ask questions to. And so I like that one-on-one -on -one solution. I'm curious, uh, are you able to do something like all the coaching by text or is there something out there that can be done all by text so you can just change the name and not have a photo or a video attached? 
you know, we haven't explored that yet, but you're right. Um, there's other ways to do the coaching besides, you know, a video, you know, text and email sometimes is the preferred method for people. So as we're, we're building out our platform, we're adding more capabilities like that as well. Um, I love the idea of chat bots. There's a lot of, you know, automation that you can derive from that so that if people have very standard questions, they can be answered in some cases by a chat bot. But we always want to give people the opportunity to speak to a live person, you know, if they, if they need to. Um, and then, you know, the other side to that is from the practitioner's perspective, um, having a consistent platform and methodology that they can incorporate um, is very valuable for them because it, it does help streamline their practice. Um, and then even if people come in under a coaching environment, um, there's a, a big opportunity for an upsell for that practitioner for those one-on-one -on -one appointments. And sometimes just introducing that patient to the practice through these other digital tools is a way to help build a bigger, deeper, more intimate relationship with that person over time. I mean, and that's brilliant because what you're talking about are the basic principles of, of basic marketing. You start with the, the free gift that provides value to them or low cost gift that provides value. And then it's increasing upsells, right? And so you get them hooked early and then you really just keep upping the amount of value that you're able to provide them. Now, I loved your point about the habit because I, my thought of like, oh, I've, to remember to have to take a photo of my food all the time, that, that is a habit I have to get into. I've, uh, I always try and go on and off something like, you know, basic vitamins, vitamin C or something, and I'll stick to it for about a week and then I completely forget about going and taking it. And so I can imagine it's, it's really just starting that habit and, and really getting that in. Are there tools that can help people build that kind of habits that they need for that? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of tools and, you know, even simple things like reminders, you know, if somebody doesn't log your food are useful. Um, having a weekly coaching session that you know you've got to prepare for. Um, having specific tasks that you ask of people, you know, like watch this video and afterwards take this quiz that'll help reaffirm the most important points of it. You know, all of those um, behaviors can ultimately lead to those changes. Um, what's also interesting is something as simple as, you know, one photo of your food, a, you know, per day um, will oftentimes allow people to see themselves differently. Suddenly they see themselves as doing something healthy and they then see themselves as a healthier person, which can spill over to other healthy habits. So fostering that kind of recurring repetitive behavior and providing feedback as well as the reward that comes with that is an important element of, of instilling that habit in a person. And eventually it becomes automatic. Um, and you start to do things um, in the background that you don't even think about that benefit you cumulatively and very substantially over time. I mean, you're totally right. Once you get into the habit too, it becomes second nature and it's difficult to stop your body from actually doing it, right? So think about things like the way you brush your teeth or the way you dry off from the shower. You do it the same exact way probably every single time. It's actually quite difficult to, to not have your body just go on autopilot. So I, I love that. Balan, I would love to ask you a question because I know we only have about 10, 10 to 12 minutes left. And I think this is incredibly important. How, what is the best way to stand out from the competition? Valent, you're on mute. There you go. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yes, so so uh, nowadays uh, we we are facing an increased need for uh, telemedicine, but on the other hand, uh, we can uh, see a big competition as well. So not just uh, the traditional uh, telemedicine providers and the new startups, but also the 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 tech giants like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Apple. They uh, they entered into the uh, the health space. So, uh, if uh, we would like to stand out uh, with the with the new service, then then we should be focused and uh, uh, to focus on a niche uh, disease treatment uh, could be uh, a good way because uh, because uh, it could help a fewer people, but but on a specific way. Another solution could be. Uh, 
uh, decisions support uh, solutions in specific fields. So again, um, for fewer uh, people, fewer uh, doctors with specific uh, problems to have them uh, could be another uh, way. And uh, still um, to think in, in B2B, uh, like, uh, like in a healthcare value chain, then, then we can find even more gaps to fill uh, with, uh, with integrated solutions uh, to automate uh, different things uh, with AI or, or, or with, uh, with other uh, solutions and to provide it as an, as an API solution to other uh, applications uh, which already have the audience. Uh, it could be also uh, a solution for stand out uh, and, and fill the, the smaller gaps uh, and make more, uh, more efficient uh, the, the actual uh, services and not to, to invent something completely, completely new. And uh, one more thing is, is there are underserved uh, segments uh, specific communities with special needs uh, like disabled people uh, so so for them uh, it's still room for uh, quality services so you said something very important in there for all startups really launching in a niche right and that's a big deal when you're a startup and uh, i've worked on many that we we just would do a well defined audience like pregnancy and new moms or um, you know dermatology or one sub specialty like neurosurgery and and connecting to a neurosurgeon because it is a well defined market and it's much easier as a startup and especially with the amount of marketing dollars startups have to reach that particular well defined niche and then you can go big like, look at Roe. Roe just raised a huge amount of capital. They launched in the male impotence space. That's just it, you know, for, I don't know how they're old. They're more than, they're not just brand new. Um, and now they're going into the female space as well. But they launched in that niche, and that really allowed them to get a hold in the market, get revenue coming in, proof of concept, and now they can launch in other diseases or disorders. I would love to ask, I think Jared would be great for this question. Another question from the audience. Does anyone use gamification in which ways? Like, Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, gamification is something that's been out there for a while. You know, I, I have a healthcare product management background and um, I'd say that it, it, was, an, uh, it was an idea uh, that hasn't really panned out. Um, there are some folks that kind of are on the peripheral of that, uh, Lavongo, some other folks that are making it kind of engaging, not really gamification. But I, I, I tend to um, look at this problem with patients because usually people think in terms of gamification as a solution to get people to engage, right? And so it's like, well, if I make it a game, then they're going to engage with my software. Uh, I think the way to think of it is uh, BJ Fogg is, is a professor out of Stanford look at his model um, and take a look at his model because really it's about, again, a patient that in one act is a very motivated and or patients that are essentially very easy to use your, your solution. And, and what we want to do is get them to go over the hump and to actually trigger something. And he really maps it out very well in terms of what, how you kind of make your, your app or whatever you're doing, um, easy to use to the point where they, they actually do something. But look at it that way instead of looking at, well, do I use gamification to do that? If you're having to think about using gamification, mm -hmm. I would look at it in terms of, well, is the problem um, big enough um, for, that, for that patient to actually use, to actually game, to use to gamify? So um, we don't use gamification. That's my experience that it doesn't really work. That it's true in a lot of things. Um, and then there are other aspects that are actual games. So if you take a look at Adam Gasly's lab, it's right here in San Francisco. Uh, he just launched his product for ADHD and it's an actual video game. So like when we usually talk about gamification, we talk about, you know, like buttons or badges or, you know, winning rewards for things. But Adam is actually treating, and it, this is uh, cleared the FDA recently. I think it accelerated because of the coronavirus. Um, but he's treating ADHD by 
kids actually playing a very specific video game. Um, same thing with MindMaze. So I'm an advisor on MindMaze and it's based in Europe and they are now launching in the United States. But it's the virtual reality for stroke and brain injury rehabilitation. And the way it works, it's really cool. Um, in the world of virtual reality, imagine your left arm is partially paralyzed. We take a mirror image of your right arm, we layer it over your left arm in virtual reality. So when you lift your right arm, it tricks your brain into thinking you're actually lifting your left arm. And that's enough to move, uh, to actually increase patient efficacy and outcomes. Now the way it looks though in world of virtual reality is you're flying a plane. Like you're not just trying to do, you know, reps, you're actually flying a plane, but you're not just the pilot, you are actually the plane. And so this is really taking gamification to the next level. And we can do that in things like virtual reality or when you're trying to do something in the neuro world, because neuro is all about that actual gaming. I know it's a little bit of a tangent, but it's very cool companies. I do have uh, just a couple of minutes left. So I do want to ask this last question. Um, I think Kelly, you're really good to answer this one. Do you see a difference in how public versus private healthcare institutions react to telehealth startups? I do. I see that health institutions by and large want to engage with the patient population that is out there um, addressing more healthcare disparities and making sure that uh, they do their best to try to eliminate them, whereas private healthcare um, entities um, often are profit based. I mean, it is called healthcare business, and we're not in this um, necessarily to just be um, altruistic, unfortunately. However, in order to bring, you know, a critical mass, I, I, I also want to piggyback off of the way that you can involve uh, some gamification. Is, is such that exactly your point, Robin, you simplify terribly high level esoteric terminology so that people don't have to have been a graduate from whatever specialty or a graduate from school in order to interact what's going on with them. So people by and large are visual. People by, by and large, if they have an investment, a self feeling, um, of, of empowerment with regard to engaging with what's going on with them, then they're more apt to do it. I, I've been sitting in a continuing medical education classes before where it, you know, it's just so high level, but physicians don't know what they, what they now, they don't know how to kind of speak with patients sometimes because they're taught to specialize and they are so good at what they do that they, they don't know that they're not simplifying it to the point of the lowest common denominator. Um, just like, you know, the USA Today is written not beyond a third grade level. That's how we should treat showing patients their own information, not just allowing them to have access, but also helping them understand it because when they're invested, they actually are empowered to be more compliant patients. And then again, also, moreover, better outcomes for the, for the healthcare practitioners. So, it's about simplifying complex information. If that's gamified, if it's, if it's a way of making sure that it's fun and engaging so that it's no longer intimidating and it's educational, that's what we should do. And that's how you get people to invest and keep going with sustained business within healthcare, within telehealth and within digital health. And so um, it's all about making sure that you speak to the lowest common denominator because everything from there is uphill and, and seamless, just to make sure that you don't cut people out through being high level with esoteric terminology that nobody understands. Make it visible, make it easy, make it digestible. That's true for everything, right? Um, in, in your marketing and everything, Doctors might be brilliant, but you throw them into a space conference and they won't understand the vocabulary. Same thing, you've got yourself an aerospace engineer, you throw them into the world of medicine and they just don't have the background and the vocabulary to understand the concepts. So really reducing it to that third grade level in every industry is incredibly important for outside, you know, people outside of that specialty. With that, it is uh, one hour to almost to the minute. I would love to thank everyone for joining us. It was a fantastic day. A uh, huge thank you to Valent, and I will throw it over to him to close it out. 
Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And uh, thank you, Robin, for moderating this session. And uh, it was a pleasure being together with you. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope that, uh, that everybody uh, could learn uh, something from today. And uh, we will continue with our upcoming knowledge sharing activities. So, so let's keep in touch.